<laughs> so my name is Jun Chitsui, and thank you for explaining my by myself. And uh, my uh, talk, uh, I will start uh, talk about cryptic selection and the size selection uh, uh, fishing in native salmonids. Uh, these are study fish, uh, mass salmon, and white spotted char. And uh, basically, uh, recreational angling is often size selective. Uh, so, but larger fish also uh, have uh, another uh, 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 behavior. Uh, for example, uh, boldness, aggressiveness, foraging activity, growth and migration. So, uh, I would like to investigate the effect of selective angling fish communities. Uh, uh, we demonstrate uh, field experiments. Uh, I will take you uh, to Japan. <laughs> We are in here, and uh, it's a uh, study stream, and uh, it's a, a study area, uh, mountain streams. Uh, you can see the uh, many uh, dams, uh, dams, 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 and uh, it's a uh, study, uh, so it's a uh, bar, uh, means uh, 100 meter, and uh, extremely isolated uh, the populations. And uh, uh, so uh, I uh, conducted angling experiment uh, T1 and A, A T2 and uh, uh, F, section F. Uh, T means tributaries, tri uh, very small tributaries, and uh, it's a mainstream. Mainstream, but uh, not so uh, big, large. And firstly, uh, uh, we conducted uh, the electrofishing uh, for two paths per year, and uh, we uh, can uh, mark individually. Uh, can you see that? Uh, yellow, orange, pink, pink. Uh, this uh, he, he is, uh, he was uh, last year, uh, 2016, uh, 189 millimeter, and he, he grew up uh, 220 millimeters. Like that. And uh, then, uh, 2017, uh, bed fishing uh, uh, we conducted uh, for uh, marked, individually marked individual, uh, fish. And I angled uh, a total of uh, 100. 45 uh, marked individuals uh, were caught and released. And uh, uh, it's my uh, research result. Uh, if uh, uh, I catch the uh, deep hooked fish, uh, uh, I, I conducted a uh, line cut release uh, for deep hooked fish uh, because uh, remark remained uh, hooked by line, cut and cut release for the hooked fish were caught and then uh, evacuated. It's a fishing result. Uh, uh, so uh, x-axis uh, means uh, hook length, uh, body size, and y-axis is uh, frequency. And uh, you can see uh, char uh, is more vulnerable to angling. And uh, finally, I uh, conducted uh, electrofishing fishing for recapture. And it's our uh, first result. Uh, so uh, a total of uh, 128 uh, individuals uh, we got. Uh, and uh, the, uh, these fish have uh, uh, angling uh, experience, uh, this, this means the number of uh, angled times. And uh, it's a, a timid, uh, there is no uh, angling experience. Uh, these fish are clever or smart. And uh, uh, three or five uh, angling uh, procedure, uh, eight char, uh, three times uh, caught. So if, uh, of course, I uh, conducted catch and release, but if uh, all, all I 
or angry fish had been harvested, uh, exploitation rate is 61.9% uh, for char and 19.4% uh, salmon. So, uh, how about uh, loss of egg? Uh, uh, fecundity uh, we estimate uh, by pre previous study, and if uh, all angled fish had been harvested, uh, char, uh, for char, as over 60% eggs were lost, uh, for even for salmon, 30% uh, were lost. And uh, it's a demographic parameters for this uh, stream ceremonies. And uh, uh, please focus the uh, adult uh, survival rate uh, for char, uh, 32%, and for salmon, 20%. Uh, it's a default uh, uh, without uh, angering effect. Uh, but uh, I caught 62% uh, chair, uh, so uh, it's a normal 32% uh, and 20%, and I removed uh, by angling uh, uh, exploitation. Uh, it's a two scenario, a normal and exploitation. And uh, uh, this scenario's uh, adult survival rate is. Uh, just uh, twelve uh, percent uh, for salmon uh, is uh, sixteen uh, percent. So uh, maybe you know uh, population growth rate uh, lambda uh, is one is uh, population level is stable, uh, but uh, it's a, uh, much less than uh, one. So uh, go to uh, endanger. So uh, already these are fish uh, endangered in the present situation. Uh, so uh, uh, 100 years later, uh, ex extinction risk uh, is 40% uh, uh, for char and 60% uh, for salmon. Uh, it's a normal, uh, normal version. But uh, exploitation version is uh, rapidly decrease, uh, rapidly uh, uh, extinct uh, these fish. Uh, so uh, fishing, uh, angling, uh, explo exploitation effect is uh, very big. And how about uh, individual level? Uh, so uh, why uh, dependent variable is a number of angled times? And uh, this uh, variable is independent variables. And uh, three uh, effect, three variables, uh, it's uh, uh, so positive, positive and negative effect. So chai is more vulnerable to angling. And uh, larger uh, and uh, growth rate is negative uh, effects. So, Lower gross fish uh, were more vulnerable. Uh, dominant fish uh, and hungry fish uh, were more vulnerable. And uh, it's a uh, main topic uh, of this study, uh, four planks and uh, distance between mark and recapture point. So larger fish, uh, it's uh, more vulnerable, vulnerable to angling and uh, larger fish is the disperser. Uh, so, uh, if uh, I remove uh, this angled fish, uh, so uh, it, uh, this part are uh, also uh, removed. So, movement pattern uh, and uh, explorative uh, behavior are key factors of vulnerability to angle. So, uh, it's a reasonable uh, result. And uh, summary, uh, population level, uh, expo ex exploitation rates were very high, 61.9% uh, ex ex uh, for char and 19.4% for salmon. And uh, extinction risks uh, dramatically increased by the creation of fishing. And uh, at individual level, larger and lower growth char uh, were more vulnerable to fishing, and larger fish uh, moved longer distance uh, during mark and recapture. 
So, uh, you know, uh, larger fish uh, is more vulnerable to angling, uh, but uh, it's a cryptic selection. Uh, so migration for long distance uh, uh, dispersal uh, fish also removed from by angling. And what is the problem of uh, selective harvesting for this person? So, uh, as I said, uh, this uh, study stream is uh, isolated from many, many dams, 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 dams. So, uh, tributary is a very, very important uh, spawning habitat. And uh, so, uh, actually, uh, total six individuals dispersed from territory to mainstream. Uh, and uh, four of six individuals were caught by angling. So uh, if, if mm, it's, it's true, small territories are source habitat uh, in this study. Uh, so uh, population viability might decrease in mainstream. Uh, it's a, a very problem. Mm. Thank you for listening. much for stepping up a little bit earlier than, um, than scheduled, so I appreciate that. Um, given you. we're a little bit running late, I might um, ask if you could keep any questions for uh, the end. We'll be putting, uh, asking the speakers to sit up the front and um, take some questions afterwards. So, so thanks again for your talk, and um, I'm sure there'll be some more questions either yeah. in the session or um, during the conference over the next few days, so thank you. Okay. Um, Rachel. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Thank I'll, yeah. Because there was a, an issue with the scheduling. Oh. So Rachel was scheduled for Wednesday. Are you happy to happy jump to in there? Well. Okay. Lost my now. I've uh, <laughs> the, uh, the excitement. I've lost my notes now too. So um, welcome, Dr. Rachel Nichols, lecturer in economics at um, ANCOS, the Australian National Centre for Ocean Resources and Security. Have I got that right? Yeah. At the University of Wollongong. Um, Rachel's going to be talking to us today and an expenditure approach to value and recreational fishing in New South Wales, something that I think all agencies, state agencies, and probably federally, uh, I mean nationally. <coughs> yeah. So over to you, Rachel. And again, apologies. Thank for, you. Uh, Confusion. That's okay, it's nice to hear I'm not the only one who's presenting sort of unexpectedly this, this morning. So yeah, today I'm going to talk about um, a recent survey that Professor Alistair McEvoy and I um, undertook sort of over the course of last year, um, looking at sort of getting an idea of what the, the recreational fishing expenditure looks like in New South Wales and using that information to get an idea of the, the value add to the local economies in New South Wales from recreational fishing and also do, to do a bit of a, an economic valuation um, study for specific sites and species. So when we think about sort of values of recreational fishing, we can kind of think about sort of the very broad social and cultural values that come from, from recreational fishing. So things like um, engaging in an activity that's outdoors, um, engaging with family and friends, um, catching fish for food, enjoying mastery over a skill. So those are the sort of more social and cultural values associated with fishing. And then we have some of the economic values that can be associated with recreational fishing, um, including um, the expenditure on fishing related items, fishing travel, and also the economic value associated with the more welfare economic approach to valuation through the consumer surplus um, value. So what we wanted to do in this study was to look at the value um, added to local economies from recreational fishing using um, data on fishing expenditure from recreational fishers. And we wanted to use this to estimate contributions to um, local and regional GDP, employment and household incomes. And we also wanted to estimate the value of recreational fishing in New South Wales to recreational fishers using... Um, sorry, Rachel, could you speak into this? Oh, sorry. Just because they're recording. 
Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, using um, an approach called the travel cost method, which estimates a consumer surplus, um, which is a measure of economic welfare. So the report that we're doing is, a, is an update to the New South Wales Recreational Fisher Expenditure Survey that was undertaken in 2013. Um, Australia is currently completing a national recreational fisher survey, which I think is also being presented at this conference. Um, and the approach that we're using is in line with other, with both this national survey and other international expenditure surveys, um, including those undertaken by NOAA in the US. So ex what we wanted to do, so first estimate direct, indirect and capital expenditures on recreational spending by both freshwater and saltwater fishers in New South Wales. We wanted to use an input-output model of the, of the New South Wales economy to get an idea of the economic output, the added value, household income and direct and indirect employment that was generated from recreational fisher spending. And then we wanted to use the travel, co travel cost method to estimate the value recreational fishers place on having access to key fishing sites in New South Wales and selected recreational target species. So in terms of the scope of the study, so we confined our study to, to New South Wales and we broke New South Wales into different regions. So we based these regions on the, the ABS um, classifications for, for regions. So this is just a map of the SLA four regions. And we split um, New South Wales kind of into six regions, half of which are coastal, half of which are inland. So the coastal regions included this mid-north coast region, the Sydney region and the south coast um, of New South Wales and then the inland regions were this northwest, southwest and we split this number eight southeast region into an inland portion and a, and a coastal portion so we could get an idea of the, um, the freshwater fishing <coughs> in that area as well. In terms of the species that we were interested in for the travel cost modelling particularly, we wanted to look in terms of the saltwater at snapper, kingfish, mulloway, flathead and bream, um, and a couple of others that we sort of grouped together. And freshwater we were interested in Murray cod, trout and yellow belly. So some of the information that we've uncovered in our survey here will also feed into um, the harvest strategy that's emerging um, for these key um, recreational fishing species in New South Wales. In terms of the survey questions that we asked, so we wanted to know how many days did they fish every year, um, either in freshwater or saltwater. We asked them over the course of the previous 12 months, you know, how many days did they fish and we asked them to break them down. We asked them, we asked them whether they consider themselves either mainly freshwater or mainly saltwater. Um, and we wanted to know did they own a boat and if they owned a boat, what were their boat related expenses in the past 12 months. And then we asked them specifically for their last fishing trip, what was the town closest to their fishing site? So um, we didn't sort of want to, we didn't want to break it down into X river or you know, X lake, but we just asked you know, where have they traveled to and then we use that as a bit of a, um, a touch point. We wanted to know how far in kilometers did they travel? How long was their trip in days? How many trips had they made to the site in the previous 12 months? What species did they target? And then what were their expenditures on their trip-related expenses like accommodation, food, boat hire, fuel, shopping, and so on. And then to finish up, we just asked the standard demographic information like um, age, employment status, and so on. So the sampling that we did, we drew from a sample of recreational fishers, our uh, fisher licenses in New South Wales, which um, the DPI um, granted the information to us. So in terms of the general profile of recreational fisher licenses sold in New South Wales, so most tend to be three day and one year, three years. So that's the red line, um, gray line and the black line with the blue line being the one month. The one month and three day licenses are sort of declining over time, um, especially in the, probably since 2019, so probably like the, the post COVID period. Um, but the one and three year licenses are sort of remaining relatively steady. Um, and we focused our sampling on these one and three year licenses because we were interested in fishing activity over the past year. And so we just focused on those slightly longer term license holders. Um, and we, did, we didn't draw from the, from the three year and other uh, three, 
day and one month license holders. So our data collection happened um, sort of in between August and October of 2022. So we first did a telephone survey where we um, recruited a, a survey company to call the rec fishers that we gave them the just the license and the telephone numbers. We asked them to call and we asked them to go through the survey with them thoroughly. Um, and they did this from August to September 2022. Uh, we then had the same company after they'd completed the telephone survey, send out emails to um, a separate pool of rec fisher holders. Um, and that just involved emailing them and then sending through reminder emails to sort of get them to, to complete. And then finally, we put a link to the survey in the rec fisher newsletter that goes out, released by the DPI, um, which was released in September 2022. So we sort of had these three different approaches to survey collection. We wanted to know um, sort of what was the data quality sort of, of each. In terms of the responses that we got, so in terms of the telephone survey, we got the largest number. We got 942 responses, um, with most coming from the north coast, south coast, uh, sorry, southwest, and yeah, south coast. And then email and newsletter yielded more or less the same number of responses, 281 and 289. In terms of the species targeted, um, most people were targeting flathead, um, some estuarine species like whiting and bream, and then the kingfish, mulloway, snapper, you know, those popular recreational species. And then in terms of the, the freshwater, it was really Murray cod, trout, and some people just targeted anything. So we had that 130 people targeting anything. So total sample size um, for the raw data was 1,512, um, which wasn't, I think, too bad. So I'm just going to present just some very broad strokes results at this point because um, the report is still being finalised and so it's not quite ready to, to be releasing the numbers yet. So in terms of the type of recreational fishing expenditure, so we can kind of break it down into sort of fishing related expenditure, the more trip related expenditures like accommodations and, and so on, and then the boat expenditures. So in terms of the, because um, the 2013 um, report did the same kind of approach, so the fishing expenditure in 2012 was 24.8% of total expenditure, and this time it was 20.8. So sort of hasn't really um, increased, or it hasn't decreased um, too dramatically, and it's relatively in line with what we expected, given the, um, the COVID situation that was happening in, in New South Wales in um, 2021, the second half of 2021. Trip expenditure, obviously less travel in 2021, 2022, has meant that this expenditure has gone quite a lot down compared to the previous report. Uh, boat expenditure was um, a far greater proportion of the overall expenditure than we would have expected based on the previous report, which I think is just coming from that sort of COVID lockdown, um, a lot of expenditure on kind of the more capital related goods, which um, I think anecdotally you see across a lot of um, different hobbies as well. In terms of the saltwater and freshwater spending, so this is just a bit of a, um, a map to show you kind of just which regions are spending sort of where. So in terms of interstate, interstate is spending a lot um, on the north coast, spending a lot on the south coast and in Sydney if they're freshwater fishers, and they're spending a lot in the northwest, south coast, uh, inland and southwest if they're freshwater fishers. The north coast spend a lot in their own region, um, so they're, they're not necessarily travelling outside a huge amount and spending a huge amount of money. The Northwest, they spend a lot both in their own region and they also go to the North Coast. South Coast and South Coast Inland um, spend a lot again in their own regions as well. And Sydney spend a lot in the North Coast, South Coast and also in Sydney as well. So sort of interstate people and Sydney people are kind of travelling a lot. They're spending a lot in the different regions and then those other regions are a little bit more localised in their spending. So they're kind of, they're not travelling too far um, to go spending. And, yeah, I'm always done. No worries. So in terms of like the data collection, I, so I, I spoke before about how we were interested to know sort of the data quality that we got from each method. So the problem with data collection is that you want to balance sort of the more expensive methods with the data quality that you're able to get. 
we found that the telephone yielded more complete surveys. So because they were being walked through the survey, they sort of completed every single question. Whereas the email and newsletter, you know, no one was keeping an eye on them. So that kind of, there were a lot of incomplete responses that we got from the email and newsletter. Um, quite a few people, especially with the email, they were invited to complete the survey and then reminded again, reminded again, and you still got a lot of people who didn't necessarily follow through with the, the completion. And then the newsletter, since it was like an open sort of invitation, um, ended up attracting a lot of people who were um, particularly avid saltwater fishers, so a lot of people who spent a lot of money, which um, made it difficult to, to combine with the, the rest of the sample just because it was sort of a lot um, much more heavily weighted around the saltwater and the, the high expenditure. So we found that the, the telephone, it's the more expensive method, but it did yield higher quality data than the, the email and the, the newsletter methods. COVID-19 impacts, so like I said um, just before with the, the spending, we found that the capital expenditure on boats and boat related items was just much higher than you would normally expect, um, which I think was just because of the um, the lack of being able to travel, lack of being able to spend money on something else just meant that people got frustrated and spent a lot on their, their fancy new boat. Um, the travel distances, obviously 2021, end of 2021, people in Sydney weren't able to travel um, outside their region. So we're seeing that I think with the, the decrease in travel related expenditures. Um, some of the regions in New South Wales weren't locked down, so some of the more sort of um, inland regions didn't, um, weren't as impacted. So there's a few um, patterns um, in the expenditure that um, are different from the, the original report. So we're still kind of combing through those and identifying kind of what lessons can be learned there. It's time? Yeah. All right. This is my last slide. Should yeah, I just go? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So just a very brief um, mention of the, the value that fishers place on access to species, access to fishing sites. So we, as I said, we measured it through the travel cost method, which um, is a very common method in economic um, valuation to, to look at this. And as um, through the measure of consumer surplus, we found consumer surplus was significant across many of the species and regions of New South Wales. So we see here just a breakdown of the, the statistical significance of consumer surplus associated with kingfish, um, snapper, mulloway for the saltwater and then Murray cod and trout. Some aren't statistically significant, so we're still teasing out exactly what's driving the significance of, of each result. Um, but I think it shows that the consumer surplus isn't uniform across species across sites, so wreck fishers do value these things differently. Um, and the final report will be coming out in June 2023, so all the numbers that I'm talking about that are sitting behind what I've presented today um, will be available then. And thank you very much. Thank you. Questions because of the time, so apologies. We will take have a quick QA session. At, we'll have a QA session at the end where um, our speakers will sit up and we'll hopefully have some time for some questions then. But there's a few days ahead of us, so maybe grab the speakers if you have particular questions. So um, thank you, and again, apologies for the um, uh, now. Is Adiel in the audience? Oops, is is uh, is not here. The next speaker is um, Ariel Perez, but he's not in the audience. I might just go and. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you had glasses on your picture, so I didn't pick. No. In the picture, I saw you had glasses. Hold it. Yeah. Um, um, so um, this is uh, oh, Doctor. Click here. Oh yeah. So um, okay. no. Uh, hang on. This is the click, and there's a as well. Okay. So I'll just introduce you. So um, welcome, Doctor Ariel Perez. Uh, from um, Belize, Mexico, Program Manager, Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. Welcome. Um, Adio is going to be talking to us today about evaluation of flats fishery to formulate conservation plan in Yucatan Peninsula of Belize and Mexico. So a bit of a different presentation from my last two, but welcome. Thank so, you. Um, I'll, I'll um, ping the glass when um, you've got a, a couple of minutes left. All right. Thank you. Some water, actually. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, glad to be here presenting some of the work that um, Bonfish and Tarpenter is conducting in the region of Belize and Mexico. Um, we're happy to present this because this is one of the um, interesting things in recreational fisheries. Recreational fisheries is usually not given much of the attention. Everything's more towards commercial fisheries, other activities. 
Um, but Belize and Mexico is found in, is part of Latin America. The study that we conducted here was mostly in the Caribbean side. Belize is part of the Central America, um, Caribbean, Mexico is part of um, the north um, part of the region. Uh, Oh, where's this clicking? Do I have to point somewhere? Just, or? just point and save it. Just, it's mm, not working. Okay, now it's working. Okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we're... Belize and Mexico, they are border each other. Um, we have found out um, too many studies that both countries share resources. Uh, we're talking about fish, water, habitats, people, and business. Um, so in other words, there has been a large need for binational strategic plan efforts and also approaches. Most countries are, are have, having their own um, agendas, approaches, but because we are bordering, there's more of, a, of this bi um, binational need um, that would help um, each other. In other words, whatever happens in Belize will affect Mexico, vice versa, but also the region. Uh, our coastal area, as you can see here in this picture, um, you can see it's seagrass. The white part used to be seagrass, but we are having a huge impact of sargassum, and we're losing our seagrass, and our seagrass is highly connected with mangroves and also coral reefs. Belize has, Belize and Mexico have, um, in the region, has the, um, is the second largest barrier reef in the world, the only one, the largest one shared between four countries in the region. So we have many activities that depend on these um, coastal habitats, artisanal f fisheries, recreational fisheries, but there's also tourism, ecotourism, and what we call recreational tourism that depend on these habitats. There's also aquaculture that occur in, in the coastal area, fin, fin fish, shrimp, and this is highly due because all of these habitats are connected. We're talking about mangroves, seagrass, coral reefs. And within these habitats here, we can we also have what we call the flats habitats, and they're important for bunches, tarpon, permit, and snook, which are all targeted for um, the recreational fisheries where we have catch and release. Some of the findings that we did, <coughs> that we had, <coughs> excuse me, from this assessment was that, yes, thank you, was that there's larval and adult connectivity in the region. Um, the entire Western Atlantic region is connected, um, and these are all based on genetic studies, tagging studies, and also modeling. In other words, we're, we're, we found out that Belize and Mexico's populations, um, they're connected among, among, between each other, but they're also connected and they support Florida's fishery. There's also people connectivity. Uh, we have found two studies that uh, in Mexico, the fishery um, generates a close to 54.2 million US dollars for Belize 56. And this is all because all of these regions are connected when people travel to these destinations. And not only it generates economy, but that comes to mind that it also generates employment and generates GDP for, for the um, respective countries, Belize and Mexico. There's also habitat loss and degradation. We have, I mentioned earlier, we have, we're losing our habitats with sargasm, but there's also human-driven direct impacts on these habitats known as dredging, clearing of mangroves. In other words, this is not just natural cause, but these are um, human-driven, and they're actively being conducted in the country, and we're all concerned because this is starting to threaten artisanal fisheries, tourism, recreational fisheries, and it's also affecting biodiversity and function of these habitats, and it's also affecting the effectiveness of marine protected areas, we were, which were designed to support all of these activities in, th in, those, um, in those places. There's also lack of enforcement. Enforcement with regulations, oops. Enforcement associated to fisheries, which affect fish population. Regulations that affect coastal development um, that eventually um, destroys habitats. And unfortunately, there's not regulations or even best practices that are adopted or developed by these countries. And we need them to prevent effects on fish behavior and ensure fish survival. If it's a catch and release fishery, we need to ensure that the fish survive 
and their behaviors are, are also not impacted, or else we will, we can, we will be able to say that we have an unsustainable fishery. There's also a lot of economic and development programs and plans, unlike any country, that want to increase their GDP, increase economies. Unfortunately, what these are doing is that they are promoting and incentivizing more production in the, in the sectors of fisheries, tourism, and aquaculture. In other words, what these programs and plans are doing is that they are maximizing resource use and decreasing the habitat value. We need this, these habitats to be able to support all of these activities. And it doesn't make much sense because we're destroying the same habitats um, that these um, activities depend on. So in summary, we're, we're saying, and through scientific studies, local um, knowledge people, they're all saying, well, our resources are already overexploited. And there's also, there's biodiversity decline. So, but we will always have this big problem in that we know there are knowledge gaps on the status of fisheries, biodiversity, and the effectiveness of tools. We would always be able, we would always be saying that every year, every 10 years, decades, right? Because we continue exploiting, and there's more need for resources, there's more need for fossil fuels, and there's more effects, for, the, for example, of climate change. And we need these habitats to be able to, um, to be able to like decrease these activities or mitigate the impacts. Now, not everything is lost. We need, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, all we need to do is look at what we have in place already, what has been developed. And one of them, for instance, is management plans, marine protected areas plans. And if there's an absence of fisheries plans, well, we need to develop them. But with this assessment, we were able to design a strategic conservation plan that would be able to address fisheries and protected areas management. Usually these two big sectors are managed individually, but they can be merged through a conservation plan that would benefit all of the stakeholders. So a holistic plan, one that is multi-sectorial. For instance, one of the biggest challenges that we have is that if we are scientists, if we are in the science sector, Sometimes we don't do education or outreach. We don't do conservation. If we're in the education sector, in the academics, universities, sometimes we're not in, in, engaged in conservation. So we need to be able to do more things other than what we're doing. And sometimes if we're in conservation, sometimes we're not doing science or even education. But we need to at least be able to support or be engaged on those things. So, so this plan should be able to work. And because that underpins one collaboration, we're in different sectors, but that doesn't mean we need to work on ourselves. We need to work also with others. We need to be more, more inter and disciplinarity, more work that involves not just biological sciences, maybe economics and so on, but we must be able to merge all of those things. Now, we should be able to also adopt or look at more human and habitat connectivities, not just the habitat or the, or the human part, but both of them. We should also be able to have more um, local, national, and region, regional implications because we cannot look at, at our borders. Borders for fish and water, there's none. So we should be able to be looking at the broader picture from small, also take it to medium to larger, larger areas. So one of the things, for instance, what we can start doing is being more involved. One, to do more education and awareness. Platforms like this, symposium, conferences, congresses, they all help in sharing this information. And Bonefish and Tarpon Trust works very closely with many different sectors, not just anglers, but also the guides, local publics, because they are the ones the, that also depend on these resources, not just fishing, but also tourism, that they also depend on um, the healthy habitats. We distribute, we developed, um, um, for instance, brochures, um, material that is important for, um, for distributing information. We also have um, our own journal. I have a copy here if anyone wants to have one, um, where we also promote everyone what we're doing, the kind of work and the science that we're doing. So 
we should be able, if we have all of these things, that means that well-informed communities will be caretakers of their resources. We need to be able to inform, not have the science in shelves and journals, but also take them to the local communities. And that's one of the things that we do. We inform actively with, through different mediums, different platforms. Um, enforcement and creation of regulations. We should be able to enforce what we have. Regulations without enforcement, they're useless regulations. But if there's an absence or of regulation, we should be able to create more enforcement, right? Now, if we are in other sectors, for instance, if we're in the science sector, I say, well, well, how do we do enforcement and creation and, um, and creation of regulations? Well, our science should be able also to inform conservation, management, and even policy. We should be able to take what we learn from science and take it to the doors of the resource managers. And that's one of the things that we do. So we, we are actively involved, not only in science. So if we were able to do this, this would also benefit communities and overall biodiversity protection, especially Belize because we, have, we are highly dependent on healthy habitats. And we should be able also to in integrate habitats and livelihood into plants. Belize and other countries like Mexico, they have fisheries plans, tourism plans, protected areas plans, development plans, economic plans, but none of these integrate habitats and livelihoods into these plans and programs. Fisheries, only fish stocks, tourism, only infrastructure, protected areas, um, ensuring everything works well in, in paper. Um, development, again, more infrastructure, economic is just about money, but we need to be able to integrate habitats and livelihoods into this. All users would continue to benefit from this if we were to do this. And we should be able to have collaboration among sectors, right? We should be able to sit together, communities, managers, academics, and the public. Um, this would create more conscious stakeholders and improve governance for the benefit of all sectors, right? We just cannot think about our sector or my sector. If all works well, we, everything should work well. So we need to also start thinking more about fish, habitat, and people, right? It's not just about fish, or just habitat people. Science for conservation, that means if we were, were to do this, we would have anglers would have more and bigger fish, guides would have more jobs and income, lodges would also have income and profits, resource managers would be able to attain their sustainability goals that are established countrywide or even nationwide or internationally. And businesses, of course, would be able to have sell more and have more profits as well, right? Uh, in other words, in conclusion, healthy, we need healthy habitats. We also need sustainable practices, right? Keeping the fish wet, for instance, minimizing exposure, removing gloves when handling, keep, keeping our hands wet when handling fish. If we do this, we would be able to have healthy, sustainable recreational fisheries. And we should be able to do, like, change in paradigm, right? Uh, do more science that integrates, if our scientists do more science that integrate things like migration, citizen science, local knowledge, education, outreach as well. Okay, I'm very thankful for um, support from um, assistant, um, Lisandro Chan, um, my supervisor, Aaron. We're all a team of um, very um, small group, but we achieve a lot with just um, our approach. So we're happy to, um, to say that we have, a, we have been achieving a lot of things, but this was just an assessment and add in other presentations that my colleagues will be doing, they will be explaining more of the things that um, we have achieved as well. Again, the, the important collaborations come through in all that talk, so yeah, great. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, if you've got any questions, Nadia, there will be a question and answer session at the end of the speech. Oh, <laughs> sorry, sorry about that.
Oh, exactly there. I can't. You're wearing a suit in the picture. So yeah, well, yeah, there you yeah. go. I'm glad to see you here. So, yeah, great. Um, excellent. I'll just wait for you to settle. Cool. Do I just so forward? So this one, I think. So um, back forward, and I think there's a pointer there. Oh. I'll just check. I'll just before you. Uh... Wow. Well, uh, okay. Here we go. Figured it out. Um, I'll just tap this when you've got a minute left, if that's right. Or you want more warning than that? Or... Uh, no, that should be fine. Uh, no, that's okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, though. So, um, thanks for uh, joining us. To oh, better. Here you go. Thank you, everyone, for um, joining us for our next presentation from Zachary Radford. Zachary is from the University of Bristol, and he's going to be talking to us today about multi-level regression and uh, post stratification to extrapolate fisheries data using sea angling as an example. Over to you, Zachary. Great. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'm Zach. And uh, as it was just said, I'm here to talk to you today about an uh, exciting technique that we've been using called multi-level regression and post stratification, or MRP for short to extrapolate and analyse our sea angling diary survey data. Uh, just to give you a bit of context on what I'm going to go through on this talk, I'm, I'm not going to go into the super techie details of the MRP-based procedure. I'm more going to give you a bit of an overview of uh, the things you could look at and the flexibility that MRP provides when you're analysing your surveys. But I'm more than happy to talk about techie stuff uh, if, if after the talk if you want to. So to give you a bit of uh, background to recreational fishing in the UK, so it's quite a high catch and participation activity with uh, this figure on the right here that you can see from a study we published back in 2018 showing that between 2 and 43% of the total removals of stocks could be by recreational fishers when you compare it to commercial fishers. But despite this, in the UK we don't have a licence to fish, so we have no idea how many people are actually participating. And we have no catch, because there's no licence, there's no catch reporting requirements. So we need to do surveys of both of these to fully quantify the activity. So when you're doing a survey, the, tr the issue that you're really trying to address is how you extrapolate to your total population. And you traditionally using this, use, uh, do this using post-stratification, where you, create a, you estimate a sample uh, mean within, your, uh, within each stratum, and then you multiply that up by the total number of people in each stratum uh, that's in your population. But when you do this, you can run into some issues, particularly around uh, stratification sizes. So to get your most accurate uh, average, you should be splitting your population into a smaller sector as you can. But when you do that, you can run into low sample sizes in some of your stratum, which means your uh, confidence intervals can go a bit wild, uh, and so you can't use the data. Uh, also, you can run into issues when you're trying to combine survey errors, which is particularly uh, the case for us. So where we have to survey both catch and eff uh, effort, how do you actually combine the errors in a meaningful way that doesn't require a lot of assumptions around the distribution of the data? So to try and solve these issues, we did a lot of uh, searching around and we came uh, across a technique, the MRP technique, which is quite common in political science, but pretty new to the fishy world. And what MRP is, is uh, essentially just generating a Bayesian multi-level model, or sometimes called hierarchical models, of, uh, of what you're looking at. So for in our case, uh, the catch and the effort of recreational fishers, and then essentially just generating a model-based mean within each of your stratum. So the way we collect data in the UK on sea angling is uh, with two separate surveys, uh, the Water Sports Participation Survey, or WPS for short, and this is for effort. It's a randomised, probabilistically designed survey of around 12,000 UK households that go and knock on people's door and ask if they participate in different activities. But, for, but then for catchers, we have our diary panel, which is a self-selecting logbook study of around 2,500 UK sea anglers, which report their catchers to us on a monthly basis. So when you start to develop an MRP-based method, it's really useful for you to map out all your different data sources and models and processes that you're going to be doing so you can figure out how all your analysis is going to flow. And this is how, what you can see we've done here. So what we start off with is the UK census. So we know how many people there are in the UK at each de different demographic group. Then we take our effort survey and generate two different models, one to get the number of anglers and the second to get how many days they go fishing. Then we take our diary survey and generate another two models, uh, one for the number of fish caught per person and the second for the average weight of a fish that's caught. 
And the way we combine these all together is to take the posterior distributions from each of these model and co models and combine them. If you're unfamiliar with Bayesian statistics, what a posterior distribution is, is essentially just a model prediction, but you get loads of them which uh, incorporate the, uh, encompass the full credibility bounds of, of your estimate. And because you've got these full credibility bounds, you can combine them together in a really natural way, and you can combine your errors across all your different models and surveys. So the next thing you might want to do, especially if you've got a post-ratification based raising procedure already in place, is do a simulation to figure out whether or not MRP actually performs any better than your, your simple post-ratification. And to do this, you do your simulation. And what a simulation does is essentially ask the question, if I knew what the real answer was, what technique would get closer to that? And the way you do this is you set up a, fra uh, a frame with what it looked like if you'd got a census level information, and you generate this from your survey data. Then you randomly generate uh, your survey data from that census using uh, different inclusion probabilities, uh, and then calculate your results with these different methods loads and loads of times and figure out which one's best. So. Here's some examples of some of the thing outputs you'll get from some of these models. And the figure on the left here is something you might be familiar with if you've done any sort of modeling in the past where you've got uh, your parameter estimates plus or minus your, your credibility bounds. But the figure on the right here is something you might be a bit less familiar with if you've not done any Bayesian modeling. Uh, and this is what's called a posterior predictive check. So if you remember from before, posterior distribution is just your model predictions. Uh, and what we're doing here is comparing them to the raw data, which is shown in the red line here. The idea being that your, the closer your bars are to your red line, the better fitting your model is. And you can see here for our participation model, the lines, uh, the lines and bars match up very nicely, so it's a good fitting model. The next thing that you can do, which is, uh, is a, a good bit of flexibility that this analysis uh, can provide to you, is uh, try and correct for some bias you might be seeing in your, in your survey. So a quite common criticism we get of our survey is it's just really avid anglers that sign up for the survey and they're catching loads of fish and it's not representative of what people are, uh, what average person is doing. So the way we've tried to correct for some of this bias is including what's called a, a diarist ID effect. Uh, and we include this diarist ID as a random effect in the model. So when we predict, uh, including the di uh, diarist ID effect, which is these figures on the left that you can see here, the model fits really well. And you can see that the model is quite good at predicting how much sea bass a person will keep and slightly overestimates what's, uh, what's returned. But because the diarist ID is included in the model as a random effect, what you can do is tell the model, OK, average over that effect. So give me a population level estimate and just uh, uh, give me a population estimate. And this is uh, what you can see in the figure on the right here, where you can see that the model actually downweights what's uh, the, the number of fish caught per person. And what that's essentially telling us is, yes, we do have some bias where we've got a small number of anglers that are catching a lot more sea bass than the average person, and the model's helping us correct for that. So just doing a, a simple comparison between the results from the two different methods for the number of fish caught and the total number of anglers. Where, so starting off with the total number of anglers, which is the plot on the left here, you can see there the model results in the purple bars and reweighting in yellow. And you can see you get quite similar estimates uh, across the different years, apart from in 2020 and 2021. And that's primarily due to COVID. Uh, we weren't able to run our effort survey. Uh, so you know, with the issues around going and knocking on people's doors during lockdowns, you couldn't really do that. Um, so we've just had to use model-based estimates and combine those with the the uh, demographic data that we have. When you look at the catch, uh, the catch comparison, you can see that we get small estimates of catches compared to reweighting using the model, uh, and that's prim primarily due to this uh, correction of some of the bias. And we also get much smaller errors uh, uh, in each of the different years. And this much smaller error is uh, it's true also for the, uh, the participation model. Um, but, and it's especially the case when you start to split your data up into smaller spatial scales. So, for example, if we wanted to know how many fish or how many fishes there are in the southwest of the UK, you get much smaller errors using MRP. Looking at the simulation results, so these, these figures are, are slightly out of date. I've not had a chance to update the, uh, the plots uh, since, because I've redone quite a bit of the analysis since I created this presentation, but the story is very similar. Uh, so what we're looking at here is the absolute difference between what the real world would be and what our estimates are. And basically, the closer the dot is to the zero line, the better 
the better the uh, estimate is. And from what you can see here, that the, uh, the model is closer to zero in almost every iteration compared to the reweighting procedure for both the participation and catch models. So what are some of the pros and cons of the different methods? So post-stratification, it's quite easy to explain and set up. Uh, you know, you're just calculating an average and multiplying it up, so stakeholders tend to buy into it quite easily, and also it's quite quick to run. But you get higher errors out of it, and also issues around selecting your correct stratification sizes and things like that. With MRP, you get much better scientific performance. It's really easy to combine your errors, and What's been particularly advantageous to us with our not being able to run our effort survey is we've been able to get good predictions where we've got limited data. But these models are quite difficult to explain to stakeholders. You know, explaining Bayesian stats isn't simple even to experts. And also, they can take quite a long time to get running and, and set up as well. So just to give you an example of some other applications that I think might be, uh, this method might be beneficial for. Um, so if you run in any sort of social science-based survey, uh, it's particularly where you've got a particularly difficult to access population uh, or subpopulation, this method's really, really good and it can really help you out. Uh, and a good example of that, if anyone here does any work on discard sampling schemes or make perhaps a habitat suitability or species presence and abundance modeling, um, the, the, I think this method would also be really useful. So thanks very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions, but I think we're doing that in the panel yeah. at the end. But probably, probably, as we are running a bit behind, we had a bit of a, a rocky start, yeah. so um, we might leave the questions for the panel, if that's okay. So yeah. um, I'll welcome, uh, thanks, Zach. Yeah, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure many people listening will want to uh, grab Zach um, during the next couple of days to talk about some of the work that he's been doing. So, all right. Um, our good final presentation in this room, um, Isabel Area. That's good. <laughs> Trying to pick people by their pictures is quite difficult. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Yeah, <clears throat> Yeah, so um, next we would welcome Valerio Shred... Oh. It's fine. Shregagalia. Shregagalia. <laughs> From the Institute of Marine Science in Barcelona in Spain. Welcome. And he'll be talking to us about fisheries-induced evolution of shoaling behaviour. So um, welcome and, and thank you for presenting today. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Good morning. And... I think I should have changed the title from this talk and basically because what I was showing today is that if we consistently and selectively target larger fish, we can modify their shoring behavior and this can increase fishing, uh, can increase natural mortality of our fish, but also decrease fishing mortality, so catchability. And we are gonna show this using a model system, zebrafish, it's not a typical recreation of fishing resources, but I will show you that we can use this kind of model to understand mechanisms of complicated patterns, but also do um, predictions in terms of food web dynamics and fishing and natural mortality, which are quite important for fisheries management. So the story started here with this complex system, in, in particular this is resembling mixed coastal fisheries in which we have many commercial fishing gears, but also recreational fishing gears. All these gears are selectively target specific phenotype, individual phenotypes, that then can have a complex uh, effect on collective phenotypes. Other fishing gears are targeting collective phenotypes, and then we start to have problems when we want to understand what's happening in the food web, in particular between predator and prey relationships. So this kind of Effects are quite complex to understand in natural systems, but we know that fishing is selective for specific traits, in particular body size, because commercial fishing is selectively target larger fish. Recreational fishers, in particular, wants to catch a large fish. So if this phenotype, body size, have a specific variability among individuals and we are selectively removing it, we can trigger a fisheries-induced evolution. And this is a common pattern in many fishing, in particular recreational fishing, in which we are removing the larger fish selectively. 
but also we can have other contexts in uh, ecological, in biological invasion, for example, in which smaller fish are being selectively removed. So as I told you, this is quite complex, so we can use model system to understand what can happen both from the mechanistic point of view, but also from the food web modeling, food web dynamics. So this is a cornerstone paper by Conover, Conover and Munch, in which they selectively target uh, body size across several generations. And as you can see that when you selectively remove larger fish, you have a strong impact on fish growth which is important for understanding also population dynamics. Uh, I will skip this other paper, but basically the same model system produced another science paper. So these are two science papers, quite important from a scientific point of view, in which they use a, the system to understand also common patterns in, in the wild. So they really connected these laboratory experiments with what is going on in the wild. And this is the system that I'm going to present to you today. It's a long-term experimental system based in, in Berlin, in Robert Allinghaus group. And there are three selection lines of zebrafish, in which the first line that I will call large harvested line, so red, is simulating a common fishing pattern in which we remove the larger fish. In particular, in this model system, in this experimental system, we remove the 75% of the larger fish. And then we have another line which is simulating the opposite pattern. So the smaller fish have been selectively removed for five generations. And then we have a control in which fish have been harvested randomly with respect to size. So red color, red line, it's fishing simulation, let's say. And then selection stopped for several generations. So the experiment started in 2006 and the experiments I will show you are in generation F13, which is 10 years after these experimentals started, just to understand what can happen in terms of evolution. So there are many phenotypes that are changing in these lines, in particular in terms of life history, behavior, reproductive investment. And I will summarize saying that the red line, the larger harvested line, has a fast life history, and the other one has low life history. So we did a first experiment. So I don't know if I can touch. Yeah, OK. Got it. Got it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So this is an experiment with zebrafish to understand what's happening when we select for size and to their risk-taking behavior. So this fish is suffering a lot of bird predation. And this is a classic test. It's called diving test. When you release them in a tank, they start to use the bottom of the tank, and then they start using the surface, and then, uh, I cannot see it. I should be able to go, go back. not to go, I cannot see the. Can, can you just go back a slide? Uh, do you want to go back a slide and try? But I should be able to control the, oh, to move forward. To move forward. Jeanette, you get any clues? Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like it, does it? There's a pause at the top. Ah, maybe I can. No. Oh, well, sorry. So what happened in this experiment, we simulate, we release food at the surface, and then we simulate a predator approaching. So when you. They start using the bottom, then they recovering using the surface of the water, all the lines, and then when the predator approach, they stop using the water surface. Okay, so it's a clear indicator of risk-taking behavior. So when we select for size and we remove the large fish, the red line, we are also affecting the risk-taking behavior with respect to the control and the other line. So basically, what we are seeing is this kind of pattern. So the red line, which is selecting the large fish, is less risk-taking behavior. So it's taking less risk, while the other line is taking more risk. So the question we asked is, what happens when we have this situation in which we have changes, changes in risk-taking behavior, and then we look at the shoaling behavior of these lines? Okay. 
And zero fish has a specific kind of behavior, so it's accelerate at about two, three times per second, and every time it accelerates, it can decide even go near the cone specifics, so use a social cue or be aware of what is going on in the environment. So we use this kind of behavior to simulate what risk-taking behavior, how can risk-taking behavior affect shoaling behavior. In particular, we and our hypothesis is that the the risk, the line, the red line, which is taking more risk, is paying more attention to the environment because it's less risk averse and therefore can lose contact with the con specifics. So basically, this called vigilance is assumed and is well known pattern in many fish species. And basically, the hypothesis is this one. So if you are taking less risk, it's because you are more risk, less risk averse, you are more scare what is going around you so you can lose contact with your own specifics and therefore you for less cohesive shoals and the upside for the other line. So to understand this, we use an integrative approach, mixing experimental evolution with individual tracking of this fish in the, in the tank, in the experiment we have seen before. And then we use the tracking of the fish to feed a model similar to the one presented before. And we reiterate the model to diminishing the, the error of the model and be able to reproduce the behavior of the fish with the model. And then using the model, we simulate two different scenarios. One in which this fish is exposed to fishing gears and another one in which these lines are exposed to a natural predator. So everything is synthetic, but allows us to really understand the mechanisms and also have a quantitative uh, measurements of fishing and natural mortality. So these are some of the results. So basically, our hypothesis was uh, validated because the fish in which we remove the large, the line in which we remove the large fish is forming less cohesive shoals. They are more dispersed, while the other line is more cohesive. Mm -hmm. And this is quite linked also to the time they spent at the surface. So there is a clear link between shoaling behavior and risk-taking behavior. This is not affected by the evolution of body size in this fish. And most importantly, it's related to the kind of movement. Because speed and burst rate, it's a very quantitative measurement. But as you can see, it's strongly correlated. So let's have a look at the model, which was implemented by uh, Patel, a colleague of us from um, theoretical physics. Basically, the model what is doing is taking the tracking data of these experimental lines, the experimental measures, feed them into this model, and then use an optimizer to reuse the, or, the error of the model. And the result is that we can have, briefly, we can reproduce the movement of the fish using the model, and they are resemble to the experimental, uh, or what we are seeing in the experiments. So the nice thing is that once we have this model, we can really ask questions of what is going on in a scenario in which we have a predator chasing the fish, like this one, or where we have, in this case, an angler moving around in the environment, which is not aware of the position of the fish and is capturing them. Or we have a trolling net or a purseiner that knows where the fish are and is chasing them. So it's all synthetic. As you can see, but we can really see, as you can see here, that in the natural predator scenario, what is going on is that when we, remo we remove the large fish, the red line, what is happening is that the natural mortality is going up with respect to the control. It means that we are, with the evolution of this shoaling behavior, when we remove the large fish, these fish are more exposed to a natural predator. And in the other case, it's totally the opposite. When we have a fishing gear chasing them, harvesting them, the same line is more ex less exposed to fishing gears. And it's consistently also with the other fishing scenario with the net. So this is a quite important information because what is going on is when we re remove the large fish from the population, these evolutionary changes of shoaling behavior are reducing catchability, basically, but increasing the natural mortality of the fish. 
So it's bad for fisheries because we catch less fish, and it's also bad for the fish because it's more exposed to natural predators. And this is quite important in particular when we want to model food web dynamics because a, a really important assumption is that we, the uh, functional response between, between predator and prey is dominated by the prey behavior, so what we simulated, and this is what we are doing at the moment in complex food webs. So, first of all, thank you to Robert and Silva that established this model system and also to the other people that are helping me in developing this uh, approach. So, again, this is all synthetic. I know it's, it's difficult to understand for people that have a more uh, feeling of recreational fishing in the wild, but I think it's a very interesting aspect to ask questions and then validate them in real scenarios. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Valero. That was an excellent talk. I just wanted if the speakers that we have now left in the room would like to come up front. Rachel and, and Zach are here. I don't think our other speakers in. And Valero, do you want to happy to stay and take questions for 10 minutes or so? I'm there. Um, okay. That would be great. Um, uh, I think Jeanette's here to help with. Um, I want to pass around the microphone. So. Uh, obviously quite a diverse uh, range of talks uh, this morning so and um, each one has uh, been I, I, I thought they were really great for as a fisheries agency it's different things I can take from that to try and bring into fisheries management um, uh, at the state level but so first I'll open up to to you guys though any questions to any of our speakers just on the, on the last one uh, I'm just a passionate recreational fisher with no scientific grounding at all. Um, so my question was based on when you extracting the large fish, um, it had a flow-on effect, if I grasped all that correctly, that um, the, it'll impact on their shoaling because you're taking away from the large ones and then lose the small ones. Um, is that also uh, could be thought of that you're taking away the large fish, which are more experienced, so they've got a more of a learned behaviour, whereas the juvenile fish don't have a learned behaviour? Yeah, there is a range of effects. This could be one of them. You are removing the leaders also, are more experienced. And there are many studies in showing a collective behavior about removing leaders, what could happen. But I think what we are focusing here is when we, we, you remove the large fish, you are removing those fish that has a specific behavior in terms of risk taking. So they take more risk. Mm -hmm. The four can, they can access more resources. So they grow more. This is the mechanism we are tackling. These large fish specifically have a specific behavior that allow them to bite more, get more resources, grow more, and therefore there is the connection with the large selectivity of the fisheries. But also the other dynamics that you mentioned, leadership, older, more knowledge, more understanding of the environment, because they learn more about that. It's also true. Yeah, so it's more complex than what I showed. Yeah, more words. Yeah. yeah, I guess a bit of a follow-up question to that. It's fascinating. Um, you, you talked about removing the la larger fish, and obviously from a recreational perspective, that might be because it's a more desirable fish, but sometimes it might be because that's the fish that's made it to the size limit that you're allowed to harvest. It, it, could it be like a size in time impact as well? So, So not overall size, but the size for the cohort of fish that are available. Do, do, do you follow my question? No. Okay, so um, the recreational fishing is not necessarily, the harvest is not necessarily random. In many fisheries, it would be regulated by the legal minimum length. Um, could that be uh, impacting? Because those fish that reach the minimum legal length sooner are those more more um, uh, aggressive fish or those fish that are more risk take, more risk taking behaviour is that something where maybe size limits could be ha having that kind of impact? Yeah. <laughs> I think so, and there are several studies in which they suggest that using our harvest lots, so protecting the small ones, those that are that need not reproduce yet, and also the larger ones, which is something that is occurring. In British Columbia, for example, with the halibut and other cases, I don't know very well freshwater, but I know more mixed coastal fisheries. 
So yes, I think harvest slot could be one of those uh, situations in which you can have a ballast unharvested and buffer this kind of effects. But still, more aggressive fish, more bold fish, more risk takers fish are those that bite more because it's an intrinsic property of the fish, not of the size. So still, mm. more complexity yeah. to the situation. Okay, another question in there. I've got a question for Zach. So really nice modelling approach you're showing there. There's often an inertia to taking up new tools because there's a learning curve. Did you come across any good resources or be it packages? Because I suppose if you're familiar with statistics, hierarchical model is pretty straightforward to code up and have a go with. A bit of bells and whistles on yours, I'm sure. Are there resources out there that make your approach much more accessible to a broad range of practitioners who might want to embrace it? Yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of resources that you can't bash my head there. <laughs> um, yeah, there's quite a lot of resources you can find online. Lots of good R packages. Like, uh, so the one I use is called BRMS. That's a fantastic package for anyone who uses it to do uh, Bayesian regression models. Uh, and yeah, there's quite a lot of resources. If you just Google doing, uh, if you do Google uh, MRP using BRMS, um, one of the first links on there is uh, Tidy MRP, and it's it's really good at talking you through it. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I'm not a statistician in, in practice, I'm a biologist, and so I've managed to pick it up. I mean, it's been difficult, I won't lie, um, especially with the uh, some of the quirks of Bayesian modeling, but it's definitely something a lot of people could pick up with, uh, with a few resources you can find easily online. Thanks, Zach. Um, we've also got uh, Adiel and Jun joining us as well, who were earlier speakers, so any questions? I got a question for you, Rachel. Oh uh, yeah. So at the start of your talk, you said that you were going to try and attribute some of your spend to individual species. Um, and so something we find in the UK is people say they're going fishing for bass, but whether or not they catch bass is a different story. You know, they could be catching a whole plethora of species. Uh, and so I was wondering if you'd given any thought to how you go about splitting up that value uh, in in like a multi-species fishery and how you account for some of that. People saying they're going fishing for the big fancy species but not really catching it. Or say they go they go fishing for cod in the UK, but they're just as happy if they catch like five or 10 whiting. Then it's more that they're interested in catching the fish. Yeah, just wondering. Yeah, thank you. Um, it is a challenge, so I think um, we had species in mind that we thought people would be fishing for, but we didn't ask whether people had caught those fish. We just asked whether people had targeted those fish. And so we don't know, yeah, did you catch them or not? And we also had a lot of people who were just willing to catch anything. And so um, and so one way we tried to do, it, do this was to look at both site and species. And so people who go fishing at a specific site and we know that, that whether they were targeting one particular fish or whether they were targeting any fish, we can kind of sort of by approaching it in a couple of different ways, get an idea of um, does it, the overall economic value associated with either the site where they're catching anything they like or the specific species where they've sort of said, yes, we're, we're catching this species. Um, it was difficult, I think, because, um, because we asked for the town that was closest to the site. Um, and we did that in an effort to sort of get a limited number of towns, but we still had a lot, like over 200. So we're sort of still in the middle of trying to get the best way to sort of aggregate that a little bit so that we get a good um, estimate of just sort of a site, um, a site value. Um, but yeah, it is a bit of a challenge. And I think maybe in future iterations of the survey, we might ask more specific questions around sort of what species do you, did you target? Did you actually catch it? You know, were you targeting something and then just were happy with whatever you got and being a little bit more um, thoughtful around the way that we ask the question. But for this this being the first time we asked for it, we just sort of just asked what we were targeting and kind of went from there and yeah, learned a few lessons along the way. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Rachel. That's great. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? We've got a few more minutes. We've got a question for Jun. Uh, Jun? Yeah. Do, um, with the, the data that you, your results that you've got from your study, have you been able to have fisheries management agencies make changes because of your findings? Have the what has been any, have you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good point, I, I think. Uh, actually, uh, 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 my study, uh, river, uh, is, um, uh, stream is uh, basically a uh, fishing profit, uh, fishing bum. But uh, neighbor uh, river basin, uh, actually, uh, all, uh, all of 
uh, tributary is uh, a fishing ban. And uh, yeah, and that uh, we can uh, enjoy the fishing only in mainstream. Yes. And uh, uh -huh. uh, basically, we call the small tributary called uh, Tanezawa. Tanezawa, of course, Japanese. <laughs> and uh, Tane means seed or mother uh -huh. uh, or original. So uh, yes. Uh, uh, so it, this means uh, the uh, juvenile or mm -hmm. spawning ground is uh, tributaries yes. and very important. So, yes. Uh, yes. so it's a, uh, I think uh, useful or uh, regulation. Yes. I think. Very good. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I missed uh, your speech, but I quickly picked up on where you were probably going. So you were suggesting that. Um, in order to manage the species, you were protecting essentially the main habitat spawning areas. So the tributaries were closed all year round. Uh, do they were they closed permanently uh, to fishing at those areas where the fish would spawn, and then you could only fish for them when they come back into the mainstream? Is that the concept? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I think spawning closure and protecting habitat is key. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, definitely. Uh, fish migration is very important. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. No, we yeah. would agree with yes. that too. That's why we have to protect or conserve the uh, connecting. That's right, yeah. and and that's and that's again you're preserving wild fish stock by protecting their habitat and allowing the fish to spawn, as opposed to trying to uh, compensate with stocking. Yeah, as a, another way. Yep. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, so, any, any more questions? Yeah, one more. This is probably the last. Yeah, question. to yeah. Adiel. Uh, well, thank you. First, uh, congratulations for the. For, for this way to spread information with, with the fishers in Belize. I'm from Mexico. My question for you is, do you have uh, some, um, what, what, what was the, the worst part or the difficult part to include the authorities in this, in, in this collaboration work, as you talk, because you, you say it's important to, to work all together. I agree with you. But I think in my side of Mexico, in the Gulf part, I think the authorities are the, are the the difficult stakeholder in this case. What do you think about? Um, yeah, it has always been a challenge um, because we do, like, for instance, we do the same kind of research, like when you were highlighting, like migration. One of if we need to change paradigms, we need to take into consideration migration, connectivity, people, habitats, so many things, but. Because our approach, or most of the fisheries studies, science, we can talk about thousands and thousands of publications. And if we look back, we continue saying our fisheries resources are still unsustainable. But how is that possible? That's because most of the research has been going towards biological aspects or or just one discipline, biology, uh, or sometimes ecology. And there's not work between scientists and scientists among different other sectors. For this reason, it's very important to always have multi-sectorial talks, conversation, discussions, involvement, engagement. It's not just anglers and the fish, but anglers and everyone else that is connected to that. In Mexico, for instance, it's challenging because in Mexico, for instance, there's no co-management. In other words, the government gives the co-manager like a group or an NGO to manage an area. In Mexico, that doesn't happen. It's mostly federal level. Everything's top to bottom in Mexico. In Belize, it's a bit different because um, there's co-management. There's a lot of science, research, small country, 500,000 people, less than a million. Um, the, uh, the government gives co-managers the authority to manage an area of fisheries, but because of that, that co-manager has more in contact with people, right? The governments, they're there in their offices, far from where fishing is occurring, but the, but the co-managers, they're there one-on-one. -on -one. So that facilitates a lot of the process in Belize. If Mexico would be able to do the same, that would be far easier, but it's it's very difficult. The system is very difficult. Um, I mean, difference from Belize and Mexico. 
So that's one of the things that we have in Belize. The difference, we have advantages, disadvantages, but those are challenging things that we need to start considering um, when we do science. Do more education and awareness. If we are in an education institute, we need to also be engaged in science and also conservation and management because it's difficult. For instance, just an example. I was talking to some researchers and we were funding some of their research, but they, were, they said, oh, but we, I don't want to talk to the authorities because the authorities usually don't listen and, and usually the, the closed doors, we don't want to hear anything, but we need to be able to do that through policies, right? Engagement and talks or else we cannot leave co-managers or even man government departments out of the picture. They need to be there. And I'm impressed what is occurring here in Melbourne is because it's kind of the opposite, right? A kind of the opposite where there's more policy, there's more engagement of the authorities. It would be great if in Mexico and Belize they would do the same. Lead conferences, um, be the facilitators, and be proactively engaged on those things. So every sector needs to be proactively engaged. Thank you. Great way to end the um, presentation. Just, 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 well, yeah. So uh, I'm conscious we're in between lunch now, but I want to thank the speakers for keeping to time, which was excellent. Thank you very much. Sorry for the um, mix-up, particularly to Rachel. That was that's a bit. <laughs> that was a bit of a last-minute um, change. But so thanks again. Thanks to the audience for the questions, and um, I'm sure we'll catch up over the next couple of days. Um, have further discussions about um, the the topics that you've talked about today. So thanks everyone. Give a round of applause to the speakers. Thank you. Um, as far as I know, lunch is now between 12 and 1 out there. So enjoy. Thank you. Get some sunshine.